If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 14. 1 Samuel 14. This is possibly, when I say this, because Steph was asking me this morning, and I told her, I said, this is possibly going to be one of the simplest messages that, I, that I've probably ever done. You know, or why well, I say that. But I'm just saying it, it's just, it just is what it is. It's just plain and simple. And, but I believe it's also alludes to some, uh, when I say alludes to some things, things, people that are going through things we, when I say see happening. And, and so it, uh, to me, it's just that this, this text this week, especially with the way this week has gone, has just been a huge source of encouragement. And it just continues to resonate uh, with me. So 1 Samuel chapter 14, and, I'm, and you can leave your Bibles there, but we're going to begin by reading verse 4 and 5. Begin with verse 4. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a short rock on one side and a short rock on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other, Sina. The front of one uh, faced northward opposite Michmash, and the other southward opposite Gibeah. So this morning, I want to bring a message very simply entitled, Nothing Restrains God. Nothing Restrains God. You can be seated. The exploits of, and this is what we find here, is, are the exploits of Jonathan and his armor bearer. And, and dealing with such, we find that their lives are eerily similar in our own walk with God. Jonathan's first battle, and you can read it back in chapter 13, it was a little hilly, but it, it's really considered to be somewhat of a plain at the city of Gibeah. And it was located along what was a major trading route, right in the middle of the allotment for the tribe of Benjamin. Now, to bring us and, and to get us up to speed very quickly, if you'll remember, it was just a few chapters ago, a few chapters ago, in which King Saul, well, Saul was anointed king of Israel. And as such, Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. So the first battle would have been in the middle of his inheritance. But now we find, now that he is king, they are going uh, against those... Uh, uh, those tribes or those warring tribes who were seeking to uh, do away with Israel and, and, and just to cause hardship on every, on every turn. So in, in chapter 13, we read of this major battle, this first battle of Jonathan and his armor bearer. Now what you read when you read that in that chapter, the first thing that should jump out to you, which is very re relevant for our, our, our message today, is that Jonathan and his armor bearer were surrounded by a thousand men when they went to battle. Here's what is very uncanny, and, and just keep this in mind because I'll be there in a moment once I tell you this. <coughs> Excuse me. King Saul had 2,000 men. So he had twice the number of men that Jonathan had, but it's not the king who went to battle. It was he, he sent his son who had less men. So they, Jonathan, his armor bearing these men, were more successful as they began to decimate the ranks of the Philistine army. But it's the second battle, here in chapter 14, that begins to pique our interest. Because the battle is located at Michmash. Michmash is on top of like a mountain. So what we find is that Jonathan and his armor bearers are also now by themselves. These 1,000, what they would call the men of Israel, they would be the most choice men, the, the most hardened fighters, ones you can really uh, count on. They'll be with you in the battle. They were nowhere to be found. You had Jonathan, and you had the armor bearer. And that was it. So what happens is when you begin to see battles, and you begin to see situations shifting and changing, say in your life or corporately or, or ever how you apply it today. What we'll find out is that most people, they'll turn and they will leave you high and dry. See, but Jonathan, 
though he was left by himself, was ready to approach this Philistine garrison and he was ready to claim another victory, not only just for the nation of Israel, but for his God. So what happened to those thousand men of Israel, if if that's what you would like to call them? Well, like in most situations, when the battle intensified, they scattered. They were nowhere to be found. In fact, it has been noted that as you read that these men of Israel, they either hid in caves, and this is the part that gets me with them. They just didn't hide. They just didn't run the opposite direction. But they actually began to associate themselves with the adversary. You'll find that these choice men of Israel began to uh, find their place in the ranks of the Philistine armies. So they were willing to fight against their own people and willing to fight against their own inheritance and willing to side with the Philistine army. Ain't ain't that that something? Somebody you think you can count on and they're going to go over here and side with the adversary. Look, not only side with them, they're going to stand with the adversary to fight against you. I mean, y'all are awfully quiet. What we need to recognize is how the adversary's strategy changed in this text. Because the adversary learned a lesson from his defeat at Gibeah. Jonathan and his armor bearer walked through a valley without any opposition. And we have been taught that it is in the valley that we face the enemy the most. So that's, oh, the valley is always the imagery of the adversary but then they had to climb a mountain extremely rocky mountain rocky face almost like a sheer mountain and these two mountains have specific names and those names simply translate one being called a thorny bush and the other a muddy bog so the first battle was easier it was in a plain alongside a road but when it intensified and things seemed to be bogged down And you couldn't go any further. And that is when you need people the most. That is when people begin to leave you. You see, we know how to fight in the valley. We've been taught our whole life that's where the fight occurs. But what happens when the battle translates from the valley and now you're having to fight on the mountaintop? Because it says that the adversary, the Philistines' garrison was at Michmash. It was on top of the mountain. So Jonathan and his armor bearer not only walked through the valley, not only did they have a climb a mountain, which we would say, oh, we're ascending to a higher level and playing to God. See, it sounds super spiritual, doesn't it? But when they finally got to the top, they found the enemy already occupying the top. See, you look around, and it's you and one other person. What do you do? Some would say, hi, tell it. We're getting out of here. There's a point to this. 1 Samuel 14, and this is the verse that just rang with me this week. And I believe it's the verse for for you today. And that is in 1 Samuel 14, verse 6. I'm just going to read the first half. Uh, We'll begin to break it down later. It says that Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. That is the key right there to what you're going through right now. And you're you're sitting here thinking, well, I'm not fighting any giant. Well, you are, you just don't realize it. You see, we would simply apply that the Philistines were not God's people. They were his adversaries. They They were fighting the people in the land. So therefore, Jonathan described them as being uncircumcised. They were not with God. They're not of God. They're not part of God's people, God's chosen people, or God's inheritance. But here's what Jonathan is actually doing with this statement. Jonathan was reminding himself and reminding the only person that was willing to link up with him and run with him that we, you and I, have a promise of God. They don't. You see, they are not in covenant with God. But we, you and I, Both have been circumcised, meaning they had a covenant agreement with God which entitled them to every single promise of God. They had something that the enemy didn't have. So while the Philistines stood on might and on self-reliance, Jonathan and his armor bearer were standing on behalf 
of the same God who had won the first battle for them back in chapter 13. Now they fight them same giants again. And they're saying, the same God who won the first battle is the same God who will win the second battle. The same God that was with me the first time is the same God who will be with me this time, the third time, the fourth time, and so on. So they got, a, they got something that, and the Philistines don't understand this. So I like how David told his men in 2 Samuel 5, 24, when he told them that when you hear the sound of the wind, bestir yourself. In other words, be aroused to action. In other words, just don't sit there and be a knot on the log. Just don't sit there and be silent. Just don't sit there and do nothing. But when you hear the sound of the wind passing through the top of the mulberry trees, you better get up and get in the fight. Because the God who is behind us is also the God who is before us. And as He is before us, He is about to win every victory. I don't know if you understand what's been going on in this church in the last couple of months. But when I went back and I began to think about what's been going on in this church, you see, from some aspects, people say, oh, it's been one battle after the other. We can't seem to get hit. I'm now beginning to look at it. Oh, let the battle come because we're getting ready to step into something that God has prepared for us, and we got to fight through it. Look, let me tell you what's getting ready to happen and what's been happening the last couple of months. I begin, and I'm beginning to hear the sound coming from God's people, which is similar to the sound that passed through the tops of those mulberry trees. And so now that we begin to hear that sound begin to resonate with God's people and within His church, then what we must understand is it's now, right now, it is time that we be bestirred. It is time that we get active. It's time that we believe in the God that we have this covenant with and that we run after Him. See, we not only should remind ourselves that we're in covenant with God, now is the time to rise up to action. We must recognize that the sound has been rushing through our services. It, you see, we want to say, oh, if it could just be like the book of Acts and a wind blow through because we have no windows and doors to the outside. Oh, how amazing that would be. But there was says that there was a sound that went out from that upper room that it began to stir the people in the city and they had to come find out what was going on. And Peter ended up preaching to 3,000 people that day and got them saved. Look, it isn't necessarily a physical wind that we should be looking for, but rather the movement of the Spirit of God through His people and through His church. That when you don't feel like praising and worshiping, you praise and worship anyway. That when you don't feel like praying, you know you come to this altar, you get on your knees, and you offer your prayer request to God because God is the one who's fighting for us, not against us. It is our God who can answer those requests like we did a while ago for Mary Wingard. Thank God she's cancer free. And the only person who can do that is our God. There's nobody like our God. Our God is an all-consuming fire. Our God is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And there is no other God like Him. So why should we look anywhere else? See, now is the time to be bestirred. We've got to recognize the sound. It's a call to the body. Be stirred again. See, you may have been stirred in the past, but for whatever reason, whatever battle you're going through, it, it, it is either beat you down, quiet you, whatever. I mean, there's multiple reasons why people do not pray or praise or I'm, I'm just struggling, I'm just going through. But when you hear the sound, you got to get in it. You can't hesitate because you might miss what God has for you. Your breakthrough is contingent upon your obedience, and sometimes your breakthrough is contingent, it is contingent, not sometimes, but it is contingent upon your prayers and your praise. You want yokes broken, ropes, look, family members saved? Look, start praising God and watch what God can do. Someone once said, action without promises is presumption, not faith. But when you have God's promises, you can go forward with confidence. You see, that is why I can't be still. That's why you shouldn't be still. Because... We have the promises of God. That's why we cannot remain silent. Or as Winston Churchill would say, go quietly into the night. We stand on the promises of Almighty God. We have His Word that no matter what we're about to face, He's right by our side. We move 
forward. We don't delay. We don't get stagnant. We don't get bogged down like, like that one mountain. We continue to press forward that if God spoke it, it's going to come to pass just as He spoke it. We cannot be still and be stirred at the same time. You see, the church must advance on the promises of God. Let me give you something real quick. 1 Samuel 15, 29. It says, and also the strength of Israel, that's the key, will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. I want you to understand who this, the strength of Israel is. Because most people say, well, that applies strictly to the nation of Israel. No, it, it applies, well, it does in that context. But it applies to those who are in covenant agreement with God. See, Israel is God's chosen people. They are in covenant with Him. Remember, He made the covenant with Abraham. But we now have a covenant with God as well through the sacrifice and the blood of Jesus Christ. So we are also covenant people. So if you want to, and this is not sacrilegious, so don't suck the wind out of there. It says the strength of Israel. But look, He's also the strength of Paul, the strength of Henry, the strength of Tommy, the strength of Thomas. Put your name there. See, it was another, it says, who would fight for them and bring them back. See, that's the confidence that Jonathan and his armor bearer had. If we go into this battle and we know that God has sent us into this battle, then God will maintain us in the battle, but the same God who sent us into battle is the God who's more than enough to bring us back. See, they were dependent on another, the strength of Israel. Let me, let me begin to really break down what the strength of Israel means. It actually uh, means victory or triumph. So, he's not the God of defeat. He's the God of victory. He's not the strength of defeat. You remember why world of sports, the agony of defeat, and you see the person flipping off the building? He's not that. He is the strength of victory or the strength of triumph. You see... He is victorious. He's already won the victory when Jesus Christ went to the cross. But he's also, he says that he is the strength when you have your victory. Because he is the one who got you to that point. He is the one who strengthened you when you didn't feel like you could go on any longer. And so... When you go from victory to victory, or when you finally, man, I finally got my breakthrough, and here I am, I'm victor, I made it through this trial, and, and I'm beginning to move. He is the strength of that victory. See, it denotes, the, being the strength of Israel denotes stability. And that, I believe, is what many people are looking for today. With an unstable world and everything that's going on in it, they're looking for some sort of source of stability. But they're looking on all the wrong places. God is the strength of stability. When you feel like your mind is going in a hundred different directions and everything seems to be breaking around you and, and nothing is going, say, how you had planned, and then you look around and say, but in the midst of all this chaos, how God is my stability. Now, I may lose it for just a minute. And I may want to fuss or do the woe is me. Well, we've all been there and done it. But at the end of the day, I stand because He is what I stand on. His promises are my foundation. So no matter what has tried to rock me throughout the week, He has caused that stability. He is my strength. He is my preeminence. But He is also consistency. You can count on Him. Just like Jonathan and them did. It doesn't matter how many battles you go through. The same God who won that one, the same God win the next one. And as long as we remain in covenant agreement with Him, then what we'll find out is the consistency of who He is in battle. The consistency of His Word. It says that the strength of Israel does not lie. He, God, can't, God cannot lie. If God spoke it, confirmed it, ever how... If God spoke it, and you know beyond a shadow God spoke it, you can count on it. Now, it may be delayed. You may be waiting on it. And in that, you get frustrated. But the consistency is, go back and look over your life of everything God has already done for you. And if He's already done all of that, 
this is a piece of cake. He's consistent. But it also says not only is he, cons- uh, he cannot lie, but it says he will not relent. He will not stop. See, here's, the, here's the, the point, and this is what a lot of people miss, is not what Jonathan could do, but what is the Lord going to do? Did you catch that? It's not what we can do. It's not if God can do it. But when God does it, what is He going to do? So here's what we have today. Isaiah 26, verse 4. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, the Lord is everlasting strength. You see, what our battles and what we're going through, what they should be doing for us right now is deepening our dependence upon God. Our faith in God. Building and firming up that relationship with God. And let me go ahead and tell you, because it, this is, uh, 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 when I say this, is, and I give you little tidbits, and, and I've told on it while in, in past times past, but I always tell y'all that when I pray the armor of God and I get to the belt of truth, the belt of truth does two things. It binds that armor together so there's no cracks in my armor for the adversary to get in. But the other thing I do, because God is a God who cannot lie, He is truth. So when I pray this, and this is just my prayer, I pray, God, not only bind this armor together so the adversary cannot get in, but God, I pray draw me closer to you, bind me closer to you. Because he's truth. And so it deep so what I'm essentially what I'm asking God for is for me, God deepen my dependence upon you and my faith in you. Let me tell you what brings that, what, what comes with that territory. You, you know, just like you've always heard, don't pray for patience. I'm not telling you not to pray for this. But when you pray, God deepen my faith in you, you can expect something to happen. And it will. Inevitably, every single time, God, deepen my faith. Help me trust you more. And then you get bombarded with all this, you know, one, one little situation. Then they say, no, you're just on every side. You don't know which way to turn. Oh, God, just deepen my faith in you. God's power is not in means. God's power is in Himself. He is the omnipotent God. The all-powerful God. It's not in anything that we could get our hands on here means. It is His power is within Him. He is all-powerful. Go back to Samuel 14, verse 6, because I told you that's going to be our key verse for today. There's a phrase in there that Jonathan says in verse 6. It says, that it may be. You see, when you begin to read and you begin to study, because a lot of people begin to point that phrase out, that it may be. Oh, with well, Jonathan, before he went into the second battle, he had doubt that God could do it. And that's what they tried to apply there. Oh, that it may be that God would save us, or that it may be that he would fight for us, or, or see us to the next level. But that's not what Jonathan's saying. Remember, he, he's already said, look, they're uncircumcised. We're not. We're in covenant. They're not. So he had that confidence going in. He's saying, that it may be, does not apply to doubt. Jonathan is signifying that all my dependence is on God for any success that's getting ready to happen. Everything and all that who I am, my family, uh, my job, my business, whatever it is that you have encompassing every aspect of your life, we have to get to the point where we say, Daddy, it may be. My dependence for all things is on my God. Not my means, not my strength, but that God can and God will. You see, that success would uh, not be possible on what I could earn or what people think about me. But success is always in the eyes of God. And that God, whatever happens, it's all because of you. You get the praise. You get the honor. You get the glory. So what can God do? I love how Job summarizes this in Job 42 and 2. He says, I know. Hello, man. Listen to that confidence. I know. That you can do everything. And that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. See how all he he ascribes all that text. And that's what we should be. Because a lot of people won't say me and I. But Job never says that. He says, God, that you can do everything. That no purpose of yours can be withheld from who? You. He didn't never say me. Or I. Back to verse 6, and we see how this applies. Nothing 
can restrain God. That's what Jonathan says in, in Samuel uh, 14, 6. He says, not only are they uncircumcised or that God might or that God can't, he says, but God, absolutely nothing can restrain my God. Nothing can hinder uh, what God is trying to do. Nothing can put up a roadblock, stand in the way. Nothing can hold back what God's hand is on or what He is moving through. It says nothing. And by nothing... It means like a non-entity that no person or thing, it doesn't matter how good they are, how special they are, or what type of interest they have. Nothing, absolutely nothing on the face of this earth can withhold or restrain our God. Maybe I'm the only one going through. Maybe I'm the only one that's ever been through. But I don't think so. Because if you've ever been through, Right now, you ought to be getting be stirred just a little bit. Because you can look back and say, well, you know, I do look back and I realize nothing has ever restrained my God. Now, I look like I've been by myself sometimes, but nothing has ever stopped Him from moving in my life. Nothing has ever withheld Him from His hand on my family. And I praise God for that. But when I look back, i got to realize, look, especially with everything going on, guys, it looks like they're winning. It looks like the adversary's taking the high spot and he's got the mountaintop. But they don't realize that even at the mountaintop, that's God's footstool. He's on the throne in heaven. His feet rest on this stuff. And he's saying, He, nothing will stop him. Nothing can restrain him. Basically, here's what it boils down to God can do anything and everything he wants to do except for one thing. God cannot fail. God cannot fail. Man will let you down. Man will leave you and desert you. But God will never fail. God will never leave you. He'll never depart from you. He's right there with you. God, what He's spoken, it will happen. It will never fail. God's Word is faithful and it is true. And it's going to come to pass. we got to be willing to fight. Let's keep going. 1 Samuel 13, verse 3 and 4. And Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was at Gibeah, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel heard it said that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines. And the people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. This is getting ready to get really interesting. Probably make you a little mad. Not with me, if you put yourself in this situation. Because being we know we're in covenant agreement with God and everything is dependent upon God. Here's what we got to be careful of moving forward. We got to be careful who we run with. Because see, Jonathan had his armor bearer. Everybody else had left. He was by himself. So here is where, because let me begin to break this down because in all this there's a contrast between two types of people. The first you find is Jonathan. Because Jonathan was truthfully a man of faith. Because when God told him to go after it, look, how would you like to go against the Philistines, train bloodthirsty killers, and it's you and one other man? And they, because later we'll find out, it says that they failed 20 men per half acre. So we do not know the exact number, but if we could determine how big that mountain was, then you could determine how many hundreds of thousands of Philistines was up on that mountain. And two men facing all them by themselves. So here they are, Jonathan, a man of faith. It takes great faith when God says, I want you to go up there and fight a thousand people by yourself. That's when I'd have to say, Lord, my bell tune's not on. I, I want to make sure I heard you right. In my fact, Moses may not be the only one who sees a burning bush. I might need to see my own right now. No, I need to go up there. But here's what he also was. Jonathan was a man of expectancy. And I think expectancy is what is lacking in the body of Christ. Because, see, many of us have been feel like we've been waiting way too long. And what we've been praying for has not come to pass. And what we've been praying for seems to have been delayed. And, oh, if it's been delayed, oh, my Lord, I've done something and it ain't going to happen. And, uh, you know, God has forgotten about Yeah, God's forgotten about you, all-knowing God. Here is the whole thing about it. Where is our expectancy? 
You see, that's why I stopped the music this morning in between the two songs. Not because I just found out about it. But one, I saw it as a chance to praise and honor my God because He did it. But I also saw this as an opportunity to build faith and expectancy in God. Because if we begin to pray, now why are some here and some are not? I, I can't answer that other than to say the will of God. I, I can't. Only God knows why. And we've got to trust His will. But here's the whole thing about it. Where is our expectancy of an all-powerful God who needs nothing but Himself to accomplish any task that He wants to on the face of this earth? Where is our expectancy at in that God? That when we pray, God, I need you to heal this person of cancer, that we're just not uttering words, but that we have an expectancy they can be healed. Where is our expectancy that when we come to God, God, I have this need. And I need you to have, and we lay it because, when I'm saying lay it, we pray about it and believe in God can do it. You see, we utter the words, but do we believe what is coming out of our own mouth? Jonathan had an expectancy. That's why he went up there and faced him. He knew God could deliver him. But he was a man who followed the will of God. He steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. So whatever God asked of him, as long as it was in, lined up and it was in the will of God, Jonathan was willing to do it. He followed God's will. So here's what it boils down to. His father was something quite different. Right here, the text I just read you in 1 Samuel 13, 3 and 4, Jonathan is actually the one who won the battle. Remember I told you earlier, Saul had 2,000 men, Jonathan has 1,000, but Jonathan is the one who went to battle in this first battle. And so he goes there with 1,000 men to fight this battle. He's winning the war. He's winning, but what do we read? Saul tells his people, break out the horns and break out the shofars and begin to blow it. And let, what did he say? He didn't say to let the enemy hear the victory. Let the Hebrews hear the victory. And what happened throughout the nation of Israel when the Hebrews heard the shofar? Mm. Saul has already gone up there and beat those Philistines. Saul never made it to the battlefield. He was watching it bleeds from about four miles away at this other city. He wasn't even close to where an arrow could even come close to him. He let his son go out there and do the fighting with less people. And when he observed and the watchman observed from the wall that his son was winning, he said, mm, I see an opportunity to claim victory for what somebody else is doing. See, that's just like David. Remember? Saul killed his thousands, but David killed his tens of thousands. See, it was the same situation. Saul was hoping to go into the city triumphant and once again steal the glory for what somebody else has done. But when the people actually recognized who was the one who had the anointing and who is the one who actually did the fighting and who is the one that actually did the battle, at David's point, they ascribed, look at David, he killed his tens of thousands, and that's when the jealousy hit Saul, and Saul sought to take David's life for the, for the remainder of his days. But here we see Jonathan, his own son, taking the glory for what his own son had done. Here's what Saul was. He was a hesitant man. Hesitation is a sign of unbelief. If God asks you to do it and you know it's God, you better do it. If you feel like, well, I don't know whether I should raise my hand in service today or not. What will somebody else say? Don't hesitate. And I know, well, Paul, you're just picking something up. Because Scripture teaches that we raise our hands to receive. And with that, and just that, look, how can God trust us? I told you to raise your hand. Why don't you raise your hand? I told you to go pray for this person. Why don't you go pray for him? Where, where, where are you at? See, we expect God to trust us with all this great, big, and mighty stuff when He can't even trust us to raise His hand and worship Him in His house. So how can He entrust the bigger to us when we're not faithful in the little? Saul was not only a hesitant man, he took credit for what others have done. We've talked about that. But he was not a man of faith. Because in his life, Saul did not trust God. We'll read later where Saul only has 600 men. God got the number down. And Saul only has 600 men. wants Saul to go fight in the battle. But Saul, when everybody started coming out of the woodwork, he started surrounding himself, building his numbers. See, he wanted everybody else to do the fighting for him. 
He didn't care whether it cost them their life or not or whom he surrounded himself with, as long as they did the fighting. And that's not what God wanted. See, Saul's life exemplifies he did not trust God at all. And because he did not trust God, everything he did, he sought to seek the glory for himself and not give the glory to God. He did not, just like Jonathan, if God, the same God gave us the victory, God will give us the victory again. Everything went to God. But Saul was seeking, blow the, look, blow the horn so they think I won the battle. That I did the fighting. Here's the problem. Who did Saul surround himself with? The first one, and to me the major one, is, I struggled with this word, I'm trying to pronounce it, Ajai. Ajai was the high priest. Well, man, that's a smart man. He surrounded himself with the high priest. Let me tell you who Ajai's brother was. It's Ichabod. The glory of God has departed. He is not only just the brother of Ichabod, but his grandfather was Eli, who allowed anything and everything to happen. Let his son steal and from the temple in the house of God. And, 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 you know, Eli was, you know, you could go through compromise. You could go through everything that surrounded. So Saul surrounded himself where he thought would be, a, I'm going to get myself a high. What he got himself was a yes man that let him go do whatever he wanted to do. And, he, and so Ajah, who did not seek God, and the Spirit of God was not on him, was the, the one in Saul's ear directing the king. Who else did this king surround himself with? I got to back up. I was getting ready to go on, but I can't. See, we got to be careful who we let get in our ear. Just because they're on YouTube and got five million followers and they're a prophet of God, doesn't mean they're a prophet of God. Doesn't mean they have an ear to hear from God. It doesn't mean they're in prayer. It doesn't mean they're in the Word. A lot of times what you end up finding out is you'll find out... Oh, Lord, help me explain this one. What you'll find out on YouTube and a lot of those social media outlets is those ones that have a Word, stole the Word from somebody else. So they have a spirit of Saul on them rather than the Spirit of God. They're trying to... Look, I'm preaching better than what y'all are responding right now because this is good. But what I'm trying to tell you is there's a spirit of Saul that's going out over the airways who's trying to seek the glory for themselves and look at the word that I got when they've stolen the word from somebody else. And how do they know they even stole it from a man or woman of God? They could have stolen it from another false prophet. And so now here they are spread... <laughs> God, help me. Here they are spreading this false report out there giving people a false hope and a false sense of security when God ain't even in it. Who else, did Saul, who else Saul surround himself with? Cave dwellers. Turncoats. The ones who, that when they finally saw Jonathan win in the battle, I'm coming back. That's the one I love. You ain't seen people in four years. But let something good begin to happen. Let people begin to be healed. Because that's what I believe is getting ready to happen in this church. Because it's, done, it's already been prophesied and confirmed by the Word of God. That, that, that it's going to flow from this pulpit and out and many lives will be... So you let, you let that moment of history begin to happen in this church and what God has spoken over this church and what God has ordained for this church and then all of a sudden, we're going to see people come out of their caves. We're going to see people that, we, that would not give us air in a jug or look at us when we see them at the Walmart. They wouldn't even talk to us on a good day. And then all of a sudden, I heard from God. He told me to come back to Tree I bet He did tell you to come back to Tree of Life Ministries. Where you been the last four years? <laughs> I got to move. Bunch of quake, caved man alive. So be careful who we surround ourselves with. 1 Samuel 14, 7. So his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you according to your heart. So here's a man that recognized that the Spirit of God was on Jonathan. 
So whatever God's telling you to do, I'm going to do too. Wherever God sends you, hey, I'm with you. Not because I need a job, but because I recognize there's something in you. It says, and you read it in verse 6 where God says He, he will not really, He can do it by many or by few. By many means, quantity, size, you know, like an abundance. Few means a little, of, a little or few, but in the root meaning of the word few, it actually means to pair off. And we see that being um, uh, come to light with Jonathan and his armor bearer. He didn't give him a thousand men to go fight in the Philistines. He paired them off. Just like Jesus Christ paired off his disciples when he sent them out two by two to go out and begin the first, the first missionary, so to speak. He paired them off. People of like mind and like accord going after God. See, what you're going to have is all those. See, that armor bearer. Let me tell you about that armor bearer. And this is just real quick. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling because I feel like I'm getting a lot of, and I'm trying to sort through it. But what you end up happening with the armor bearer, the armor bearer is an individual who will go to hell and back with you. They don't matter how bad it gets, they're right there. They'll never leave you. They'll never doubt. They may pray about it. They may seek God. But as long as they see God move, as long as they know God's leading, they, I mean, they'll fight, they'll stand. It doesn't matter how fierce it gets. I want you to note something. God, mostly throughout Scripture, if not all the time, diminishes the numbers before He sent His people into battle. Look at Gideon. Look at Jonathan. I mean, we could go through. Look at David. He brought down to those who were in one mind and one accord who would trust God with the outcome and with the battle. Joshua 23 and 10 says, One of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he had promised you. See, he would cause the enemy to flee before them. God had promised not only to cause the enemy to flee, but God says, I'm going to fight for you. And that's, I'm just telling you, I don't know what you're dealing with this, here this morning. And I don't know how the adversary has just bombarded your mind this past week. But you need to know that the covenant-keeping God who cannot lie, who cannot relent, has never stopped fighting for you. He's not stopped, not, though it feels like it. He has not stopped. i tell you something that I see happening and going on on the face of this earth right now. Didn't realize it until I read this text. Is in 1 Samuel 14, verse 15. What is it that caused the enemy to scatter? It says that God sent an earthquake among the Philistines and fear gripped their heart. See, we think the ground earthquake, shaking, ground splitting open, you know, those types of things. Here's what began to happen when Jonathan and his armor bearer made it to the top of that Philistine garrison. The earthquake was the panic of God. That's how it translates in the original Hebrew. So did the ground shake? Did, it could have. But when you translate the original text, God sent a panic in their spirit throughout the camp. Let me explain, because it was heart-wrenching to me at one time, and, and I, don't, I don't want to go into full story, I just want to tell you what I saw, is what got me one time, and me, Steph, Katie, and I were standing there, and I looked around and Katie said, it is kind of overwhelming, isn't it? And I said, this part is not overwhelming. What is overwhelming me right now is look at the looks on the people's faces. They are in panic mode. And they're grabbing everything they can to what they think they're going to need to survive or get it while they could get their hands on it. I said, that's the part that bothers me. We have people all around us that have no hope like we have hope. They, they feel like they have no God who is fighting for them. Because, and they don't because God, they may not be in covenant relationship with God. And what we are seeing, and it will intensify and get even greater, because it was Jesus Christ who said and predicted that in the last days, that men's hearts would fail them. Why? Because of fear. The panic of God. 
And so what we're beginning to see, because people are worried about jobs, they're worried about food, they're worried about gas, they're worried about all this stuff that is going on. It is not necessarily about the means, but it is about the spirit or the panic that is going through. Because God is still trying to draw people back to Himself. He has not stopped nor relented in that. So there was a panic. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. We need people like this armor bearer. We need people who will come together, pray and praise and worship and with a word of encouragement and with their countenance bright. So that Because if you're down and broken hearted, sometimes just running into that person with a smile on their face who isn't doom and gloom all the time, so it's got, it does something to your spirit. It energizes you. goes back to being stirred. See, what did he say? He said, Jonathan, I am according to your heart. See, as the Spirit leads you, He will lead me and you as well. He'll lead both of us. See, it is very important that we connect with and the right people that's going to have the greatest influence over our life. Iron sharpens iron. What happens? We bump and rub off each other. That's what he's talking about. That's why it's important that we get engaged in worship. That's why it's important that we get engaged in the Word and engaged in the altar service because this is the opportunity that we have to come together that we bump and cling off of each other and we sharpen each other because whatever we faced this previous week has dulled us down and we couldn't cut hot butter if we tried. And God brings us back together so that we bump off His Word and we bump off the worship and we bump off each other because God's getting us ready for the battle the next week. Though He's the one who's doing the fight. He says, I need you sharp for what is about to come. Look with me, 1 Samuel 14, 13. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed him. It says in Scripture that when the enemy standing in their garrison, all their, everything they had on their armor and their prowess and, and who they were, the numbers. They saw two little old Hebrew men crest the top of that hill coming to them. And it says they laughed at them. They mocked them. God says in Revelation, Yes, I see you and I know your works and I know that you are of little strength. It has nothing to do with numbers. It has to do with the God who sees. They laughed at him. They mocked him. Here's what I need you to notice. Notice how they approached their problem. They climbed up on their hands and on their knees. That is the posture of prayer. That is the posture of adoration before God. That is the posture of someone who is humbly submitting themselves before the God of the universe. Because what the Scriptures say, God goes out before us. Jonathan did not get on his hands and knees to submit to the giants or the Philistines. He got on his hands and knees because his God was before him and he was submitting to the God who was going out ahead. They climbed on their hands and knees. Remember, the enemy took the high ground. They took the victory. Jonathan had to get there. He had to fight for the victory. I never noticed this about this text. Jonathan, because the armor bearer always followed who, 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 who he carried his armor and equipment for. So Jonathan was out in the lead, the armor bearer was behind. It says they were on their hands and their knees, approaching this problem, approaching these adversaries. And here's what we read. It says that they fell down before Jonathan. Oh man, I hope you get that. Before he got there, They were defeated. Before he got there, God had already knocked them down. Jonathan might have been on his hands and his knees, but they were down on their face. Jonathan hadn't gotten there yet, and he never got up from that posture. He continued on his hands and knees on that mountaintop, and I told you, 20 men per half acre. 
And they were falling one at a time before he got there. The only thing the armor bearer was doing was ensuring they were dead so that nobody could rise up behind them. He was, he was basically ensuring their death by either sticking with a sword or a spear. So as Jonathan is, I mean, he's plowing his way through on his hands and his knees. And the enemy, one at a time, one at a time, whether it be health, whether it be finances, whether it be your lost loved ones, one at a time, those adversaries will fall when we take up the right posture. When we're willing to per persist and be willing to go in. And then the armor bearer comes behind us and makes sure the enemy doesn't come back at us. God did the fighting. But Jonathan did the submitting. You want to know how to keep moving forward? Submit to your God and get on your face before Him. Let God do the fighting. Look, this is what I see happening in this text. Can't you see them walking through that valley? And when they look up, there's a mountain on this side that's covered in thorns and thorny bushes. There's a mountain on this side that is muddy and it's like a bog. And we're walking through the valley. Now, while I told you a while ago, we're in this valley. And so we're walking along. But they did not meet any opposition in the valley. So they're walking. Talking. Conversing. Whatever. We don't know what they said. But they're walking together. Side by side. Man, I would have thought we'd already got into a battle by now. I thought somebody had jumped out behind a bush trying to scare us or something. But they're walking through that valley. Then it says they get to the mountain. And it's rocky. And it's almost sheer, almost flat. And they've got to climb to get to Micmash. You get to the top. Can't you see them walking through and now they're beginning to climb? I told you the enemy was already occupying the top. Because the enemy did not want them to claim the victory. You see, the adversary is trying to get you and keep you from getting on your knees. He's trying to keep you from walking through the valley or fighting your way to the top of the mountain. And if you do, he's trying to occupy the high space because he doesn't want you to get another victory. Because if you've got something that will build your faith in your God and in His power, His might, and His wisdom, then He has less of a hold on you. So He's occupying the top where they're climbing. I mean, I could see these two men climbing. We don't know what was going on. We don't know what was said. This is what I imagine. They began to sing. They, as they climbed, every, every foothold, every hand grasp, they began to sing. They could have sang something like this found in Leviticus 26. You will chase your enemies, and they'll fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. Then they climb just a little higher. And to get to Deuteronomy 28 verse 7. The Lord will chase your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way, but flee before you seven ways. Sometimes your fight's not in the valley. Your fight is not as you climb. Sometimes the adversary doesn't want you walking out the promises of your God. The enemy doesn't want you to be able to get to that height and to claim what God has rightfully given you, your inheritance. Remember, they were fighting in Benjamin. Jonathan was fighting for his allotment that God had given his family and also fighting for a nation. And so now he's fighting for the promises of God. You promised this portion of this land to the tribe of Benjamin. And I'm fighting for this portion of land. I'm fighting for my family. Now I'm also fighting for my nation. We've got to get these uncircumcised out of our nation. See, he does not want you to experience another confidence-building victory. Like Jonathan, we need to be fighting for our families. But it's also time to get this nation back in the covenant with God. And it's time to fight for the inheritance that God has bestowed to us. And I'm not willing to let somebody else do my fighting for me. I'm willing to get on my hands for myself and do my own fighting for my family. 
and do my own fighting, my part that I need to do for my nation and for my community. But are we going to let everybody else do the fighting? And then we cut, are we going to be the cave dweller or are we going to be the mountain climber? That's what we got to determine today. Are you going to be those who show up with all the fights? Man, yeah, we sure whipped in, didn't we? And you ain't done nothing but hide in a cave the whole time. Where are you at? Hebrews 11, 33 and 34. Who through faith subdue kingdoms, work righteousness, obtain promises, stop the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of wickedness, wickedness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. You see, you are going to be hard pressed in the Word of God to find anyone in the Bible in which you could say they had it easy. It, oh man, they, it was a bit, they had it made. Everyone that's in the Hall of Faith had moments of a crisis of belief. They had moments they had to fight and they had to press through. That's why they're in the Hall of Faith. It was seen, and it does. The more you walk with God and trust in God, the greater the difficulties become. Each and every one of these people walk by faith and not by sight. And it says, and listen to it carefully, by their faith, not one, it says kingdoms fail. So more than one kingdom fail. It could be a physical kingdom as a nation, but also a spiritual kingdom. Kingdoms fall. It was by faith Daniel, God shut the mouth of the lion. It was by faith that when the Hebrew children for their belief was thrown into a fiery furnace, that they walked around barefooted and didn't even get blisters on their feet. They come out, they didn't even smell like smoke. And, but when three went in, Nebuchadnezzar said, I thought we only threw three in. How come I see four? And the fourth one looks like the Son of God or the Son of Man. You see, it goes back to like Jonathan. God goes before us. He's in the fire with us. He fights for us. And He'll deliver us no matter the circumstance we find ourselves in. Look, you may be weak right now. We're, we've all been there. But it says that by faith, they become valiant in battle. It's not too late to get in the fight. Valiance is the process of showing courage or determination. In other words, we are determining. Let me do it this way. That's it. Enemy, you are not coming past that line. I've had all I can take, and I can't take no more. I've reached the end of my rope, my limit, whatever you want to say. But you've gone as far. See, he cannot go as far as we allow him. He has no authority because our hope and all is in God. God doesn't, and he can't do anything that God doesn't give him permission for. But we've got to be determined that we're saying, this is it. I'm making a stand right here. But what, but what bugs me is how far we allow that line and, that, and we keep, all right, will you cross that line? That's right. So we, we back up, we, we weaken. Well, I'll give you another line. Don't cross that line. But as long as you don't cross that line, we're cool. And then you come back and you draw another line. And next thing you know, you're not doing anything in your life but backing up the whole time. God didn't call us to back up. He says, stand, and we're standing in this evil age. In other words, here is my line for me and my family. Anything beyond it, it is not permissible. And I am taking a stand. I am determined to see the glory of my God in the land of the living. I am determined to see my family saved. I am determined to see my community changed. I have become determined and I will not, because my God does not relent, I will not relent. Where he goes, I'm going to be the armor bearer trailing behind him. It was their determination that saw nations being, their nation being birthed. Determination is the key to changing everything. We can't give up now. The, many, the enemy may have taken the high ground. But remember, it was God who went before him. The enemy's defeated and he doesn't even realize it. Let me close with this. Because this is the key. Verse 6. Verse Samuel 14, 6. When Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, 
come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. And it may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by few or by many. Like Jonathan, we must place our trust in God. In this case, the Lord, the name Lord, is translated as Jehovah. He is self-existent one. He is eternal. He is the am that I am. He is the one who was, always will be, and is to come. See, this is the covenant-keeping name of God. And throughout Scripture, we have read or we have heard it as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. We have heard it as Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner, or Jehovah Shalom, the Lord or our Prince of Peace. There are over six, there are 16 compound names for God throughout Scripture. And when you go and study each of these 16 names, what you will discover is that there is a name of God that applies to each and every situation that you have been in, that you currently are in, or that you might be getting ready to go in in the future. He has a name for whatever it is that you're about to face. For there is nothing that can hinder God from saving. Saving during times of war. Saving, in other words, to help, to assist, to deliver, or to defend. There is no one or no entity that can stop our God from saving during the worst moment of your life. He has come to save you, to deliver you from the clutches of your adversary, and to defend you against those who would despitefully use you. He is the God who fights for us. He is the God who has kept us this entire time, and He will be the God who will see us through whatever it is that you're about to face tomorrow. You see, if Jonathan had not taken the measures to face the enemy alone, many scholars believe that this could possibly have been the demise of the nation of Israel. It took Jonathan and one other person on their hands and on their knees in the face of the adversary for God to give them the victory. And while they were in a position of submission, God made the enemy fall before Jonathan. The only way for us to advance is through submission. And in his book, and I've just started it, Praying Like an Apostle, chapter 1, and I'm going to surmise it to you real quick. Alistair Begg wrote this. You want to pray like an apostle? And you want to see God move. And you want to see the enemy scattered seven different ways. The power begins on the knees. That sums up chapter 1 for you. A posture of submission before God. It is that position. And in that position... God does the fighting. And nothing, and I mean nothing, can restrain our God. I still say, and I even feel it now, that's the only reason why I'm sharing it, that currently, there is a lot that could have been rectified or not in the direction that it is currently headed. It was contingent upon the obedience and the actions of the church. I said that two, three years ago. I believe, I truthfully believe, because it Scripture bears that out. When He says, "If my people, covenant keeping people, if we would take up the posture of prayer, submit before God." I'm telling you. It's Scripture. It moves God. And God does the fighting. A lot of what you're going through, a lot of what we're seeing, a lot of what we're experiencing can be handled if God's people 
would submit. That's it. Just submit. And let God work it all out. We've got to get out of the way. Listen. I believe that is the biggest hindrance that we're facing right now. We will not get out of the way and let God be God. 